Now let me get this right. The Torah is done away with, except for tithing, and the Ten Commandments. Except for, well, maybe there's only nine commandments, because one of them you're able to change into whatever form and method best serves your life. Uh, and then Yeshua nailed the commandments, the Torah, to the execution stake, but he did not nail the commandment of tithing or the ten words, which is kind of nine. Didn't he? He kind of he he didn't nail them to the stake. He left them on the ground, so that we would be able to use them, kind of however we want to. Um, yeah, you know, let me let me go here. Uh, shalom, everyone. Welcome to this week's Living Torah. It's Mike Clayton, joined to Hashem, and um, you know, it, it's it's amazing to me as I as I look, as I say something like that that there's there was actually a day uh, not that long ago when you think about it that those statements made some kind of sense. Uh, in the words of a friend of mine from Israel, Baruch Hashem, uh, thank God that he opened, he opens our eyes to see the wonders of his word and the transformation that happens in the midst of that is amazing. Now, we all, all I, I think we would probably understand it, and I've taught this numerous times, but when Sh Rav Shaul says that he that, that Yeshua nailed the the law is the law of sin and death. It is not the commandments of the Torah. Uh, you know, we could take this to a number of places. Let me let me throw one more out at you. Uh, have you ever made the statement or heard the statement the Torah is bondage? Well if if the Torah is bondage, then why didn't the Almighty give the Torah to them when they were in Egypt? a place in which they were slaves. That, that would have been a great time for bondage. Well, it was bondage, but it was bondage of a Pharaoh who was uh, not lining up their lives with these words. So it's, it's and I'm going to get to this in just a few moments, but when we look at these words, it's all about our perspective. So we're going to take a, a good look at this of a different perspective today. Uh, first of all, we want to go to uh, chapter 18, and this week's Torah portion is referred to as Etro or Jethro, and it is the meeting of, uh, of Moshe and his father-in-law, uh, Etro, who was a priest of Midian. Uh, Midian had numerous gods, and here's Moshe uh, came back from the burning bush experience, probably, and said to Etro, uh, I have a re revelation for you. There's, there's not multiple gods. There's only one. And so I'm going to go back to my Abrahamic roots. I guess we could say it like that. Could we say Moshe was returning to his Hebrew roots? Yeah, maybe so. And so he leaves and he goes into Egypt. And we've read the story of uh, the account of all the things that happened there in Egypt. He then comes out of Egypt and is, uh, here is, here is Etro, his father-in-law, and he sits down and he begins to tell Etro uh, all of the wonders that happened in Egypt about the plagues, the crossing of the Reed Sea, the, the Egypt being laid waste, all of these things that happen. And what we see with, uh, with this is that in, um, that Etro actually says, he states now, and this is verse 11, Now I know that Yudhevavhe is greater than all other gods, because he rescued those who were treated so arrogantly. And Etro, Moshe's father-in-law, brought a burnt offering and sacrifices to Elohim. Um, what do we get out of this? There's, there's something I think that's for each of us. We all have family, do we not? Um, you know, we have family, I don't, I don't know about you, 
but maybe you know maybe with your family when you know you came to this realization that the Torah is not done away with and that this is something for our lives today and you went to them and they said wow we've been waiting for someone to come and teach us about this and we're so thankful that you're the one no uh, that that's not quite the way it's happened for me <laughs> probably not the way that it's happened for you it probably didn't happen that way for Moshe either. That Itro, when Moshe comes from the burning bush experience, he goes to Itro and tells him about it, and Itro's like, well, whatever, okay? What, you go do your thing, and um, I'm going to stay here in Midian. And it was all of the things that happened through Moshe's life that was the testimony to Itro that brought him into a relationship with the one true Elohim. Could we say... The possibility that the Father will once again do the same thing and that he is, he will use and maybe is, is using the things that you and I are walking through today will become the testimony that will bring those around us to that knowledge of the one true Elohim and of the Torah in which he gives to us. Now, the, uh, the, the setting is to bring order. First of all, everything needs to be set in order, which is kind of something that the Almighty likes to do. I mean, he began this from the beginning. There was so-called chaos, and he brings order out of it, which should be a, a, a really heartwarming thing to us today, that as we see the chaos around us, remember, that what looks like chaos to us may be order to him, and what looks like order to us may be chaos to him. So let's try to walk in his order, not some other kind of order. Uh, wow, I could I could say a few things there that I'm going to I'm going to pass on, but he first of all sets in order this this thing that Moshe is doing, and that is he's spending his every day. Every waking moment of every day, we would call it in counseling. Yeah, that's, that's what he was doing. He was counseling everyone. Now, I've known numerous pastors, leaders that have uh, had a so-called counseling ministry. Uh, for the most part, I know that every rule has an exception. For the most part, they're the most worn out people on the planet. Because what happens is that the uh, those that I call the low impact people, high maintenance, low impact people will end up coming to you over and over and over again and sucking out all of the life that is in you. And for Moshe, he thinks that's the job to do. Itro looks at this and says, Moshe, you're taking on way too much for yourself. You need to set up order in the camp so there's a filter system. It's not that he is to, uh, to separate himself from the people. He's not to separate himself from the needs of the people. But this filter system of the, the tens and the hundreds and, and on through, the people would be coming to those leaders and... The vast majority of things that were happening in the camp, uh, you know, this person said a bad thing to me and I got offended because this person put their tent peg too, too close to my tent peg and, you know, yada, yada, yada. Uh, those things didn't need to come to Moshe. But there were things that did need to come to him. And so the setting up of the leadership in the camp was a setting up of order it was also a setting up of a filter system so that the low impact, high maintenance people were kind of dealt with down on this level. But those that I refer to as uh, low maintenance, high impact people, those people had some issues that probably only Moshe could deal with. And when they came before him, he was able to see them then as the leadership that they were and maybe even begin to put them into the roles in the camp. Uh, the question, I had this conversation with someone this past week, is your time spent 
Think about the people that are in your life. Are you spending more time with low impact, high maintenance people or high impact, low maintenance people? If you're doing, if you're spending time with the low impact, high maintenance, you're going to bed really tired at night. You need, there's, there's times that you just have to look at a person and say, you know, I know that this is, uh, and this is what James Dobson called reality discipline, uh, is telling somebody the truth. You look at him and say, you know, I've talked to you about this issue numerous times. Your, your issue has become your identity. It's evident to me that you're not willing to make the changes that are going to be needed for you to move past these issues in life. So I'm cutting you loose. I want to tell you, I will always be here for you, but I will only allow that for you to be when you come willing to make the, thing, the changes that need to happen to bring you to the next level. Until then, you know, go find somebody else. I'll pray for you. I'll smile at you. Whatever. I'm not cutting off the relationship, but I'm cutting off this, this draining from my life. And that's what Moshe needed to do, which setting up order brings forth order. Uh, chaos, sorry those that would be teaching evolution today, uh, probably nobody that's listening to me, but chaos does not bring order. Uh, you know, you, you, you look at a... Um, a publishing plant. It does. You don't light a bomb in the middle of it, and out comes a book. You don't go to Boeing and set off uh, some kind of an explosion there, and out pops a, a 747. No, uh, order brings forth order. Chaos brings forth more chaos, until someone takes it upon themselves to take that chaos and to change it into order. Um, with with Moshe here, uh, very interesting in verse chapter in chapter 19, is that they set up camp in the desert. There in front of the mountain, Israel set up camp. And it seems a little redundant, except for that if you look in Hebrew, it says that Israel set up camps in the desert. And there in front of the mountain, Israel set up a camp. Singular. So when they got there, they had come out of Egypt in military array. They had come out in some kind of an order, but along the way, that order had become chaos. So when, they, when they began to camp in the wilderness, here at the base of the mountain, it was that chaotic thing. They had lost the order, and that order had to be restored. That order was restored by Moshe, accepting the advice from his father-in-law and setting up leadership in the camp. You know, Moshe would not have had time to go around and tell each person where, when, and how to set up their tents. But he could tell the people, okay, you are in charge of this many people, and this is how their tents are to be set up. It's, it's a very simple thing. Anyone that's ever been in the military, you understand that there has to be order. What is it that they teach? The first thing that is taught in the military is marching. How to get from one place to another. Now, when I went in the Army, uh, I had gone through Navy ROTC, and so I understood the concept of marching. I was able to even take those that were having a hard time with it and take them to the side and teach them. But the, you know, I knew, I mean, I know how to, here's, here's point A, point it, you know, point out point B and tell me, get there. Okay, I can do that. But can you do that with a crowd of people in an orderly fashion in which no one gets hurt, no one gets trampled, and you do so in a orderly fashion. So Moshe is teaching the people things that uh, is taught in, in the military today. Where do we get all this stuff? Where do they get this? It goes back to the Torah, and I would say goes back to the heavenly hosts, 
which are also order. So when we do things in order in the natural realm, we're allowing ourselves to come in line with the spiritual realm. The spiritual realm is not a realm of chaos. The spiritual realm is a realm of order. If you and I try to put our chaos into his order, it's not going to fit. We must first seek. That's why this, the, the verse says, Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in the heavens. It does not say on in the heavens as it is on the earth. It's talking about his kingdom, which is his order, being established into our chaos, which will then bring forth order, which is called the kingdom, by just, you know, by the way, okay? Um, now, the, it says that the, 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 they're told, prepare for the third day. Uh, a wonderful study in scripture is this concept of the third day. Uh, Yeshua speaks of this of, uh, to Herod. And I believe it's in the prophet Hosea. I didn't check that reference. I think it's in Hosea or Habakkuk. I believe it's Hosea that talks about the third day. And it's it's a time in which there is going to be a new beginning. It's very similar to the eighth day of a new beginning, something something going into. Uh, We we could look at this as today it's been... Uh, approximately 2,000 years, Yeshua says to Herod, you know, I will, you old fox, I will do works in the first and second day and, and then we'll be revived. Um, go back and, and look at that scripture. Go to Blue Letter Bible. I didn't write it down, but you, you can find it uh, and, and see what this means. And it, it appears to be, to me, I think it is prophetic of a two-day period or a, as Peter would say, uh, going back to the book of Barnabas, going to the Psalms, that a day is as a thousand years, so there will be a 2,000 year period, and then we will enter into something different. Again, that is the kingdom in my estimation. Now, in this, we go down to uh, chapter, again, chapter 19, verse 16. On the morning of the third day, I'm just going to read these verses because I so enjoy reading them. On the morning of the third day, there was thunder, lightning, a thick cloud on the mountain. Then a shofar blast sounded so loudly that all the people in the camp trembled. Moshe brought the people out of the camp to meet Elohim. They stood near the base of the mountain. Mount Sinai was enveloped in smoke. Because Yudhevav had descended into it in fire. Its smoke went up like the smoke from a furnace. The whole mountain shook violently, and the sound of the shofar grew louder and louder. Moshe spoke, and Elohim answered him with a voice. Um, I know there are those that have done research about where Mount Sinai is, and it, there's pictures of a, a dark, uh, burnt area there at the top of it. Um, I, th- I think, you know, it's fascinating. J- just the thought of the whole thing is fascinating. That here's the people that are gathered down at the bottom. There, there are those that believe that the mountain was raised like a hoopa and that the people actually came underneath. Uh, that's, I mean, I can see the plausibility of that. I'm not going to say that I agree with it or not agree with it because the concept is still the same either way. This is a bringing of people to a hupa to give them a contract, a, a contract as it would be a contract of marriage. Um, the, the thick darkness, the clouds, the, I mean, who doesn't, I, I love a good lightning storm, or at least I used to. I'm not as, we had a tornado over 10 years ago, and I'm still, after all these years, a, the lightning storms are not quite as exciting, especially when they got a lot of wind associated with them as they used to be. But uh, imagine the, the the whole thing, these people standing there, this cloud comes down, there's lightning, there's, there's, there's thunder, and then there's this shofar. And this is the point, I guess, that for me is, is the big one. This shofar that is not blown by or sounded by mankind, 
but by the Almighty Himself. And it says that it sounded louder and louder. Now, I've been sounding a shofar uh, for over 20 years now, and I have not gotten this ability yet to go louder and louder. Why? Because I run out of breath. But see, he doesn't run out of breath. And so it gets louder and louder and louder to where there's, there's this trembling in the camp. i got, I got to tell you something that happened uh, at, at Life Assembly here in Franklin a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Daniel and myself, and, and also we have uh, a couple of other young guys, uh, uh, Philip with, with his shofar and uh, Daniel's two of Daniel's sons have their little shofars and they come up and uh, it's it's become quite the quite the somewhere between very powerful and very cute okay um, but a couple of weeks ago it was pretty much just myself and Daniel and we both use the Elon Bull that came from Yaakov Rice the person that for what is it almost 20 years now to begin this program is uh, the shofar of Yaakov Rice. That's his signature call. Uh, that shofar that um, uh, he, he developed that, and many know Yaakov went on to, to make shofars. He's not able to now because of health issues. But he, he started making these Elon Bulls many years ago. Uh, he made himself one. And he made one for me personally. It's actually signed, the inside of it is signed by him. When Yaakov got to the place he could no longer sound the shofar, he actually gave that one to Daniel. And so we have two. They're not matching, but they're, they're very close. And uh, so we, our service begins with the Shema, it, and then we sound the shofars out toward the congregation. Uh, these shofars, the Elon Bulls, if you've ever heard these, have a very interesting sound, very low pitch sound. But uh, we've we they, they kind of level out sometimes, and they make this little uh, wobbly kind of sound. Some of you that are, you know, Mike, you're a sound engineer, you understand what I'm trying to say. I have no clue. Uh, they make this kind of, in technical terms, Mike, wobbly thing. Um, and it's, it's it, it kind of unner unnerving a little bit. Well, uh, a couple of Shabbats ago, I actually was standing fairly close to Daniel, but I just all of a sudden took a step in closer to him. And it was like in the, not just in the natural realm, but in a spiritual realm, these shofars, they connected. And the sound that began to come out of them and these this vibration in the room, um, when we quit sounding them, there was a, uh, the, the only way to, to explain it is a, is a holy hush. Uh, there, everybody was just kind of wide-eyed looking at us and, and us at them. And it, it, was, it was a moment. I mean, there's, there's no doubt. And, but consider as, as much of a moment as that was, it's nothing compared to what it was on Mount Sinai. And here we, we see this, uh, as, as Barry Phillips would talk about, uh, the, there's a, a tension. There's a tension there. And we see this uh, in our Foundations for Life program. Barry kind of goes into a little bit more of this if you want to catch that program. But the Moshe is, it, it, or, or this, the sounding of the shofar, the, 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 the darkness, all of these things, it produces this tension in the air, a tension very much like uh, we would see in the, in, in the life of Peter when he's, I think it's Peter that's, uh, that's holding on to the feet of Yeshua and saying, depart from me. There's, in the spirit realm, when, when you and I are introduced to, and, and that, those, it's like those realms come together, and I, I, I pray, you guys, that you, you understand that you've been in places like this. It's like those, those two realms are coming together. Uh, there is a tension in the spirit of, do I run? Or, you know, or well, I, I know I should run, but which way should I run? Okay, Should I run out the door or run to the altar? Uh, Kathy asked me this years ago. This is before I even pastored. Uh, so this is back in late 80s, early 90s. 
uh, I was studying for ministry, and she said, you know, what kind of church would you like to pastor? And I had no idea uh, the word Torah in those days. Most of us didn't. Uh, what, what kind of church? And I said, I would like to pastor a church in which a person that comes in the door, uh, in the midst of the service, they either, they either have to run it back out the door or run to the altar, one of the two. That there's no in-between. And I was, I was very blessed that I, I did pastor that, that church. Uh, it, was, it was a place that I've seen people literally, and uh, some of you that are watching will, will remember those days. We literally saw people run out the door. We literally saw people run to the altar. And I long for those days to happen again. Uh, let's, let's spend the rest of the time in chapter 20. And I'll tell you a little different twist on this uh, the, this year. Of chapter 20, I, I think that the maybe where the Ten Commandments have become very confused. Let, let's face it. These are the most... Uh, the, the most read words, the most uh, uh, copied words, they're, they're, these words have been expounded on. You see these words on, um, on, on plaques. I probably have two or three of them here in my house. But at the same time, these are some of the most misunderstood words. And part of it comes from a, a misunderstanding of what the words really are. Let's let's take the word commandment out of the out of the out of our vocabulary just for a moment, and let's look at it a little different. The word is devar. Then Elohim, devar, devar. There's a couple of other words in there, but it's it's basically devar, devar. He, he there was words that he spoke. Kol. Uh, there's there's four words. It's devar, kol, at sea. I, can't remember that, that other word, devar. So what is the word devar? Okay, we're going to get to that in devarim once again. The words, but this word devar is a dalit, a hay, and a resh. Dalit is the door, is, is known as a door. The, uh, the excuse me, dalit bait, yeah, <laughs> get that right. Dalit bait uh, resh. The Dalit is known as a door, the bait is the house, and the resh is the head. So we look at it like this, that the words are the head of the house, the, the head of the house is the door. How's that? that that's Devar. The head of the house is the Devar, and the door is the head of the house. It, it can work either way. Either way, we see that this is an entrance. This is a way to come into. So the, here, let, me, let me explain it to you like this in these terms. Uh, let, first of all, let's go to verse 2. I am Yudhevav, hey, your Elohim, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the abode of slavery. Now, if, if we want to go back to the command, you know, the word commandments, that, that's not a commandment, is it? That's, that's a statement. Look at it like this. That verse 2, I am yud heh vav -Hey, your Elohim, is an introduction to the owner of the house. It would be like um, if, if you went down to, you know, to your favorite box store or something or went and you know, got a wood-burning uh, plaque or something, and it, you put your name out on the front of the house. You put your, the number your address, and then you put your name. Verse 2 is about him putting his name. So that when you walk up to the house, there's no question in your mind of who owns the house. I am yud heh vav -Hey, your Elohim, and I have given you a door, which is the head of my house, to enter the house. I personally believe that this is a, a wonderful picture of Messiah and how he has become the door. He is the head and becomes the door into the Father's house. I could probably go over to the Gospels and back that up pretty well. What do you think? Uh, so he, he is an introduction to the 
person of the house. Next commandment, you are to have no other gods before me. You're going to have to make sure of yourself a carved image. And, and I'm, I'm going to let you guys, you, you can read each one of them yourself. Uh, and I, I challenge you to do so. But for a limited time here, uh, what is this commandment about? It's what is allowed in the house. Okay, it's his house. And there are certain things that are allowed in his house and th certain things that are not allowed in his house. It is no more difficult than that. Um, you know, there are, if, if I invite you to my house, there are rules for my house. There's things that are not allowed in this house. Um, you know, if you, you come with a, you know, your, your uh, stash of, of DVD horror movies, don't expect them to come over the door, over the threshold. Um, you you want to come, you know, a person wants to come with their Harry Potter books and, and, and sit up here and upstairs read? No, it's not allowed. It's not allowed in the house. Uh, you know, Christmas trees, Easter eggs, uh, things like Halloween, stuff, it's not allowed in the house. Okay, so this is, this commandment of have no other gods before me is his statement of ownership of the house and his statement of what is allowed in the house and what is not allowed in the house. Very simple. Uh, next one. Verse 7 is, you are not to use lightly or use in vain the name of Yudhe Vavhe or Elohim. Uh, Yudhe Vavhe will not leave unpunished someone who uses his name lightly. There's numerous levels of interpretation of this. Uh, I was talking to our group last week and said, I, my favorite is a little boy. Some of you heard me say this. A little boy that said, uh, taking his name in vain is when you're talking about him without thinking about him. If you're one that's you know given to OMG and, and all this stuff, why don't you lose it? Okay, why don't you lose it? Because his name is to be held in uh, in utmost reverence. We're not just to throw his name around. You know, I, I know again that there is uh, there's numerous levels of interpretation of this commandment, but it, it comes down to this: that he is he is told us he has introduced himself as the owner of the house. He has now told us what is allowed in the house. And so the next thing he's saying is you need to respect me as the owner of the house. Don't show disrespect. Don't show disrespect for me by bringing things in that are not in accordance with the way that I run my house. Very simple. Uh, verse 8 is about Shabbat. There is a special day of the house. If you've, um, you know, growing up as, as I did, uh, we had the blue laws in Florida. Uh, there was, you know, there was no, no gas stations open. There was no restaurants open. Uh, it wasn't just Chick-fil-A you know, in that day or, uh, or Hobby Lobby. It was nothing's open. And so you went to church. And you came home, and you had a family meal, all right? Sunday dinner. Um, it's, it's still a tradition, I guess, in, in a few places. Uh, for us, it would be a Shabbat meal, Friday night. Maybe you do Havdalah, okay? Those are special times to commemorate a day. So the, the, the owner of the house is telling us that there's going to be a special day of the house, and that day is going to commemorate the owner of the house. That day is not to be changed. That day is not to be tampered with. It is Shabbat. Now, look at it. It says, remember the day Shabbat. It doesn't say, and I, I, I just, uh, you know, I'm going to go here one more time. It, and it don't uh, you know? Don't judge anybody that doesn't get this. Okay, it's it's a some things are progressive revelation in people's lives. Sometimes people just they, they just don't listen. Okay, 
or their, their listening doesn't affect their way of life, which is like last week's Torah portion of Shema Shema. Uh, some people just hear, but it doesn't affect. So the, the idea of Shabbat is that, you, or, or of Shema, is that you, you hear something and you allow what you hear to affect your being. That's as good of a, a definition of Shema as I can come up with. So it says, remember the day Shabbat. It doesn't say, remember the day, the Sabbath. Okay? Sabbath is a Greek word. Uh, actually, it comes, I, I guess, from, from Latin. But it is a made-up word. It's not a biblical word. But it is a made-up word and basically means a time of rest. So can Sunday be a Sabbath? Yes. Can Tuesday night from 7 to 8 be a Sabbath? Yes. Because you can define words however you want to define when those words don't come back to a concrete meaning in Scripture. But it says, remember the Shabbat. And if we go through, go back to Bereshit, Genesis, we will find that he names the seventh day Shabbat. So when we go to Isaiah chapter 66... And it says, they will come before me from one Shabbat to another to worship me and one new moon to another to worship me. There's no, there's no, well, what does he actually mean? Because the end, Isaiah chapter 66, which is about a time past the millennium, that, that's the eighth day, lines up with the first day. So he says, remember the Shabbat. So this is not about, well, we're going to come in the house, and I know the owner has a special day that, that he has, but we're, we're just, I know he won't mind if we change it, because it's really not convenient for us. You know, I mean, there's, there's, there's sales on that day, and, and there's games on that day, and there's, there's things that are happening on that day that I really want to be involved in, so I'll just change what he said. If, if that's the attitude, uh, you need to go back to the first and second word and read those, all right? Or go back to the word, word, and just rewind, just, just rewind. It is a, then uh, verse 12, uh, honor your mother and father. What's that about? It's about giving honor to those who brought you to the house. Let's face it, folks. If it weren't for your mother and your father, you would not be listening to me today. It is your mother and father that brought you into the world. You know, was your mother, your father, both, either, or were they honorable? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe not. Okay, um, those of you that know my my story, a lot of what's behind me in my on my bookcase here. That's that's a lot of my life. And you know, there's this thing about I think it's Australia back there. Uh, that's that was part of my father's life, and you know, he came back from the war, not real honorable, but. Having things about him is my way of honoring him. Uh, maybe people don't understand that, but that's the way that I—that's the way that I've come up with to honor him. So, if you know, maybe a person was not honorable, but honor him for the simple fact that you wouldn't be here without him. And then, what about honoring your mother and father, Abraham and Sarah? What about honoring those your mentors? You know, why do I have a, a, a picture of a friend of mine that's been dead for uh, 30 years, close to 30 years now, behind me? Because he's one of my mentors. My grandmother is, th these are mentors. Uh, some of the teachers that have been part of my life, my, the pastors, the, the, the people that have, uh, that have spoken into my life. These are the, the ones who have brought me to the house. And I'm to honor them. Um... It's about treatment of others in the house, is the rest of the verses here. So we've talked about, uh, already, we've talked about who owns the house. He's the one that sets the rules for the house. 
that we are to honor those who brought us to the house and gave us the, 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 the foundation. This is why it would not be a good idea for someone to speak uh, detrimental regarding my vacation Bible school teachers or my, vac- uh, my, my Sunday school teachers. D- did they know what the Torah was? No. Um, you know, my, my grandmother used to fix me homemade sausage all the time, and it came from a pig. Um, but that's, it was not revealed to her. But what she taught me laid a foundation so that when this was revealed, I would accept it. So let's don't, let's don't as, as someone would say, diss those who brought us to the house. And then let's learn to ha- how to treat those others that are in the house. Okay? And here's where we go. Uh, do not murder. Well, you know, there's... This is not just about, this is not uh, just about killing someone. Uh, I've had more people try to murder me with their tongue than I have with anything else. And some have done a really good job of it through the years. Uh, I've had people try to murder me with, with slander, with gossip, with backbiting. Uh, I could go on and on and on with, with terms to use for these things. Murder is when you're trying to destroy someone, whether it be their physical life, their emotional life, or their spiritual life. That's all tied up in this concept of murder. So if you're, if, if you're constantly uh, downgrading someone, you know that, what that is? That's murder. That's kind of a stout word there, isn't it? Um, so respect, respect their lives. Uh, do not commit adultery. Respect their relationships. Okay? We all have relationships within the house. We bring these relationships into the house. And so we need to consider that there are boundaries. There are boundaries in those, in our relationships. Uh, if, if you come to my house and I have the, the bedroom door closed, we, we have our, our grandkids come over and we normally close the bedroom door. Guess what? <laughs> it's to remain closed because maybe there's, there's things in there that they don't need to get a hold of. So this is a boundary. We need to respect the boundaries of people. I remember, uh, I was up in, um, uh, up in the northwest, I'll just put it that way. And I was speaking in one place. I went to another place. I was with some friends, and uh, we had a, a couple of people that had said, you know, we'd like to to come over and 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 hear more teaching by you. So I called these friends. They said, yeah, this is no problem. In fact, you know, we've got a. They could sleep on the couch. We don't have an extra bed, but they could sleep on the couch, and you know, maybe pull out a, a, a you know something in the living room. Uh, the next morning, one of the people that was sleeping on the couch, uh, these friends of mine told me they woke up, opened their eyes, and this person is standing there in the bedroom looking at them. That's not respecting, <laughs> and that's creepy. Um, we found out later that this person was a little creepy, but uh, th- this is not respecting the boundaries. So we all need to understand that in, within... Um, within those in those that are in the house we all have our different place in the house we have our different boundaries in the house let's learn to respect those boundaries uh verse 15 do not steal that's pretty easy respect others possessions Uh, this goes really along with uh verse uh verse 14 verse 15 kind of tie together here. Verse 13, they, they all tie together. For if you don't respect a person's life, you probably won't respect their boundaries and you won't respect their possessions. Uh, don't go looking for another person's gift. If, if I, I have, I know what my gifts are uh, and I know what other teachers' gifts are. So I need to respect the boundaries of 
what has been given to those people. This is not just, you know, uh, don't, don't pick up if you're, you know, you're walking around and you see somebody's got a nice pen on the table, you grab it and put it in your pocket. Yeah, okay, you shouldn't do that. But this respecting that which is in the natural will bleed over into that which is in the spiritual, or at least it should. Verse uh, 16 is, uh, well, do not give false evidence against your neighbor. Again, it goes along the same thing. Uh, you know, don't gossip. And, and by the way, if you see somebody that's doing something, uh, don't tell everybody else about it. There's, there, you know, it's, that's the, the concept of uncovering the nakedness that we see with, uh, with Noah, and we go over to the book of Leviticus and see that. There's, there's things that we might know about each, each other, things we see in each other. Maybe we just need to keep it for ourselves. My pastor years ago, Pastor Rick, used to say, when you see somebody something in someone's life, you have a choice. You can either spread rumors or you can consider that the Father has shown you this in order to learn how to pray for that person. Which one's going to bring forth greater fruit in the end? Yeah, I think the latter. Uh, six, verse uh, 17, do not covet. Very simple. Respect the other's blessings. Respect blessings in another person's life. Do we do that? Uh, you know, there comes a, a, a leader, a teacher. The father begins to work through their life and, and use them in, in, you know, in, in great ways. Am I going to respect that? Or am I going to begin to covet that instead of working on my own gift? Because maybe that person's being blessed at a, or is being used as a blessing in a, in a way that is to provoke me to, uh, to get my own stuff, stuff straightened out, okay? So respect others' blessings. Let's go real quickly to uh, verse 15. So the people stood at a distance, but Moshe approached the thick cloud, the thick darkness where Elohim was. A question as we come to the end this week. Are the words of the Torah, when we go through these words, are they producing a, a desire for distance from him? Or a longing and desire to come closer to him? We all need to ask ourselves that question. There's, there's three ways that you can, that you can actually look at the, the scriptures. Well, one is kind of a religious exercise of, well, I, you know, been there, done that, read it. Okay, I read the Torah portion this week, and now I can go on to something else that's a lot more, you know, uh, that, I, that I like better, and I can just sit down and watch TV the rest of the day. Uh, that, ladies and gentlemen, I think we all know is, is wrong. Uh, number two is we, we, we can read the words and go, you know, I, I, just, I, I just need to distance myself from it. I'm, I'm not ready for any greater teaching. You know, I think this is the idea that Shaul said, of, I wanted to give you meat, but all you allowed me to give you was milk. Because it's like, well, I'm okay right here. I don't need to go any farther. And then there's that other aspect of, I've heard his word, and I don't care what I need to walk through. It doesn't matter how dark it looks in front of me. I have to get closer to him. I need to find that greater, higher relationship with him. Remember, it was Moshe. It was Moses who walked through the darkness to find light. Sometimes we've got to walk through darkness to find his light. What do you think? I, I think that's a pretty good uh, statement for our day. Well, Shavua Tov. Have a blessed, pro prosperous week. Uh, Bezrat Hashem. God willing, see you again next week. And until then, be strong. Ya'er Adonai Panabelecha 
וייחונך. יישא אדוני פניו אליך ויישם לך שלום